today. But before we do that, uh, let's finish what we haven't done yet, namely to incorporate viscosity. And uh, so yesterday, we had four equations, physicist friends conservation equations, two energy conservations for photons and baryons, two momentum conservation equations for photons and baryons, incorporating the interaction between photons and baryons to keep them at the same speed. Then we solve them by assuming that photons and baryons have this equal velocity. So that's a very tight coupling approximation. Then we got the sound wave equation. That was a beautiful thing. And that sound wave equation is a sound wave equation for photon baryon fluid with the correct sound speed reduced from 1 over square root of 3 times c. That was beautiful. But uh, we didn't really talk about this viscosity effect because in the limit that the photons and baryons move together, this viscosity term is exponentially damped, so there's nothing, there's no effect. So, uh, in a tight coupling approximation, when photons and baryons move at the same speed, the uh, photon viscosity dumps exponentially, so we're going to take into account by going into the higher order in a tight coupling approximation. There's no, not, there's no magic here. We solve the same equation, but we just go to the higher order in the uh, tight coupling. Namely, now photons and baryon fluids do not move at the same speed there will be a small difference between them. And let's see how that works. Uh, before we start, let me remind you what we have done. So yesterday, we simply said, OK, these two velocities are nearly equal. Their uh, difference is suppressed by 1 over Thomson scattering cross-section times number of density of electrons. And we took this to be infinity in the end. That was the first order tight coupling. Today, We'll add second order term, so it's 1 over sigma t n e square. Then you plug this equation into the uh, fluid equations, uh, the uh, conservation equations we had, and then in the end take sigma t n e to the infinity. Okay? It's a very systematic way, and in this way, we're basically looking at scales in which photons and baryons are not quite moving uh, at the same velocity. Right? Very systematic approach. Then we get this, again, complicated looking equation. We are not yet replaced uh, velocity with density dot using energy conservation. Yeah, this is the intermediate result. But we still have to do something about this viscosity here. How do we get viscosity? Well, you have to actually solve Boltzmann equation to get uh, viscosity, but I'm not going to do that because the uh, primary purpose of my lecture is to understand the physics. In fact, if you read any fluid mechanics books, like Landau and Rifschitz, or Weinberg's uh, older textbook, this uh, very famous one, Gravitational Cosmology, you learn that uh, generically speaking, the uh, deviation from the perfect fluid in terms of source energy tensor this will be viscosity, what we call viscosity here. Generically, is given by the velocity field differentiated spatially. In other words, velocity gradient. Yeah, remember that this, uh, this is the velocity potential. Therefore, the spatial derivative of that would be the velocity field. And one more derivative will give you viscosity. That's a completely generic result. Okay? Only thing that's not known is the coefficient which you need to find by solving Boltzmann equation. But you can understand the result physically. First of all, it's proportional to photon density simply because it's an energy momentum tensor. And second of all, it's proportional to 1 over sigma t n e. What is this? This is a mean free path, the distance traveled by photon between two scatterings. If mean free path increases, that means that the photons and baryons do not move together. Therefore, viscosity increases as mean free path increases. Okay? So you could have written this result without 32 over 45 if you already read Fluid Mechanics book. Only thing that uh, Boltzmann equation gave you is the 32 divided by 45. Right? So 
use that in here, then now we use the energy conservation equation to eliminate a velocity potential for delta rho dot, then you again arrive at fluid equation with only one difference compared to what we had before. This term here, that's the only difference. This term is the first time derivative of density perturbation. This is the friction, okay? You have a second, uh, two derivatives in time of the density and two special derivatives of the uh, density. That's the wave equation. But now you have a friction term here that's proportional to delta rho dot, so that will damp waves because of the friction. And this damping factor, damping rate, gamma, is given by this formula whose physical meaning becomes very apparent later. For now, you just, you should be impressed that uh, you got such a uh, result by simply going into the higher order in the tight coupling. No Boltzmann equations, well, almost no Boltzmann equation, okay? Note that this rate is proportional to Q squared. Now, Q is a wave number. Uh, it was K in Professor Seth's uh, lecture. In fact, everybody, almost all people use K for the wave numbers. Weinberg's textbook doesn't. I follow his notation. Uh, so Q is a wave number. This is important only for large multiples, okay? Small scales. Higher Q means smaller special scale. So indeed, the, uh, on large scales, damping is negligible, which means that on large scales, much larger than photon mean free path, viscosity is negligible, hence, a photon barium fluid that is a nearly perfect fluid, no damping. As you go to smaller and smaller scales, or uh, wave, shorter and shorter wavelengths of uh, waves, you get damping. Just like a miso soup, you know, when you perturb the miso soup again, and you have shorter wavelengths uh, ripples, they damp faster. And now solution is not just a wave equation with this term here. Now this cosine sine will be multiplied by exponential damping. That's what the friction does. The uh, exponent would be the damping factor integrated over time. Okay? Now you can schematically write this. Okay? Now time is 1 over Hubble. So that's 1 over H here. Gamma had Q square here, and gamma also contained one over sigma T and A, mean free path. So you have Q squared times mean free path times Hubble length. Okay? So that will give you the characteristic damping scale called silk damping scale. The, the first person who said acoustic sound waves should be damped was Joe Silk. That's why we call silk damping. It has nothing to do with this. Uh, Silk as the clothes uh, that I I Indians are very proud of. <laughs> uh, and uh, now, one over Q silk will be the diffusion length. So this is the geometric mean of the mean free path and Hubble length. What does that mean physically? So let's look at the situation. The mean free path of photons between scattering would be 1 over sigma T and A. That would be mean free path. Below the mean free path, you cannot treat photon barium fluid as a fluid, okay? Photons are freely propagating. So that scale, we don't want to touch. We are way above that scale for the CME power spectrum. Now, however, still at the microscopic levels, photons are freely propagating, bouncing off each other. So there will be the random walks. Okay, if you go to smaller scales, there will be the mean distance separation between baryons and photons. Simply, photons will have the uh, random walks away from baryons. Number of scatterings per Hubble time would be the mean free time divided by the Hubble time or mean free pass, uh, the uh, Hubble length divided by mean free time, mean free pass. So that will be number of scattering will be sigma t and a divided by h. Then diffusion length would be what? Random walk length would be square root of the number of scatterings times mean free path. That will give you, in fact, diffusion length would be the geometric mean of mean free path and Hubble time, uh, Hubble length. Yeah? 
Very transparent, it's very clear. That's exactly what you get from this kind of higher order solution automatically, but uh, yeah, it's very nice. But phys physics is quite simple. We can understand it by simply having the uh, diffusion lens. So let's say you have photons randomly scattering, doing the random walks, and you have the, uh, uh, let's say, hot, hot photons coming from the hot region, cold photons coming from the cold region. When they meet and mix, obviously anisotropy will be damped because they're mixing hot and cold photons. There will be no anisotropy. Uh, below this diffusion scale. That's the source of experimental damping. So we call it silk damping, and indeed you have these oscillations, but then there's an exponential damping. Okay? And usual lectures stop here, but I wanted to go one step beyond. Let's put the numbers in. It doesn't quite work out. So uh, we have two Q, because this is power spectrum is a squared quantity, we need to uh, take the square of the exponential, so that'll be minus two Q squared by the Q silk. Now, um, I hope you remember that uh, approximately speaking, L is given by Q times RL, where R is the distance to the last scattering surface. It's a geometric relationship, right? Remember, angle that subtains the half wavelengths, distance from which you can figure out the angle, from which you can figure out L, that's given by pi over angle. So L silk, characteristic length scale would be Q silk times RL divided by square root of two. Q silk is 1.14 megapascal inverse. That's 1,370. That's a bit too large, no? There, clearly, damping occurs a bit earlier. Why is that? That's because the, uh, there's a finite thickness of the lasso scattering surface. Lasso scattering doesn't occur instantaneously, although we pretended that it was instantaneous. Now is the time to do the uh, better approximation. You have a finite thickness of the lasso scattering surface. Now imagine that you have the acoustic waves whose wavelengths are shorter than thickness of the lasso scattering surface. You integrate over line of sight, so now you have the cosine and sines, which are oscillating faster than the thickness of the scattering surface. You integrate, you exponentially damp the waves. This is, this has got the name, Dick Bond called this fuzziness damping because the thickness of the scattering surface makes the scattering surface fuzzy. Or Weinberg called this Landau damping for some similar phenomenon where you, uh, take the uh, oscillating sound, uh, cosine signs, you integrate over time, and then uh, you get the damping of the uh, amplitude of the oscillations. So you need to take that into account. And uh, thickness of the lasso scattering surface is about 250 Kelvin. The uh, lasso scattering surface is at 3,000 Kelvin, so about 10%, there's a 10% width. Then uh, you work out that uh, the exponential damping factor for Landau damping is actually comparable to silk damping. You take that into account, then you get damping scale, which is 1,100. So it nicely matches the damping scale, okay? This Landau damping shows up again when we discuss uh, polarization of gravitational waves. So uh, keep that in mind. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Good, so we seem to understand everything now. Let's recap. When you can ignore the sound waves, you're looking at the very large scales where the uh, scales are bigger than sound crossing lengths. It's gravitational effect only. That's a zucks wolf effect. And uh, delta T over T is one third of, of phi. Okay? That's that. zucks wolf and remember that for scale invariant spectrum, it's a constant. But then, once L gets greater than 100, that's the uh, sound crossing lengths at the last scattering surface, you have to take into account sound waves. That you can figure out by simply using first order tight coupling approximation, so velocity of photon, the velocity value are equal, and you can only use, you can derive this using only, no balance migrations, 
conservation equations. Yeah? But then you can take into account the viscosity by going one higher order in tight coupling, tight coupling approximation, and you can get exponential slick damping and random damping if you are a bit more careful. Yes? Matter power spec the question is, would the matter power spectrum have a silk damping too? The answer is yes. So oscillation has silk damping. But overall power does not have silk damping because that's dominated by dark matter. Right? But if you look at the varying acoustic oscillations, indeed there's a silk damping. Yeah. Yes. Good. How do we find the widths of that scattering surface? There you have to solve the uh, recombination process. So uh, it takes time for electrons and protons to combine together. Um, let's say, um, what is it called? Uh, the uh, recombination uh, ionization fraction. So initially, ionization fraction was unity, then goes to a very small number later. Somewhere in between, Photons are decoupled from electrons. But, and uh, if this uh, recombination process was very fast, then uh, decoupling will be instantaneous. But it's not quite, it's not quite abrupt. It has a gradual decrease in ionization fraction. Therefore, that comes, that will give you the finite thickness of the last scattering surface. And this is something you can calculate very, very precisely using atomic physics at a temperature of 1,000 degrees, so that's something we understand quite well. All right, so now let's determine the composition of the universe. So we do this way. We can use a computer calculation to recreate the state of the universe this sound traveled through. The universe at this time is dense like a liquid, such as a soup. Ingredients of the soup are the same as those in today's <laughs> universe. Matter that makes stars and galaxies. And dark matter and dark energy exist, even though they cannot be seen directly by our eyes. Galaxies can keep their shapes thanks to dark matter providing gravity. It's thought that the universe's expansion is gradually speeding up due to some dark energy pushing space apart. These are the three main ingredients of the soup. And of course, we forgot to mention photons. <laughs> photons are very, very important the ingredients of the soup. Space <laughs> expanded with time. Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. You see the initial stone, bam, then you get Great. sun waves. I have a pattern for the cosmic background radiation. The reason that this particular pattern does not match our observations is because the ratio of ingredients in the soup is wrong. Waves do not travel through in a thick soup like they do in a thin soup. I'll use the power spectrum to make the patterns match. I have to adjust the ingredients to make my calculation agree with the data. Incredible! Incredible! <laughs> the visible part of the universe, like stars and galaxies, makes only 5%. The universe is dominated by invisible components. Yeah, that was pretty surprising, right? <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, because it's really that when people uh, discover accelerated expansion from supernovae, first announce the, their results, although I know it's recorded, nobody believed it, okay? 
because they discover that uh, supernovae are dimmer than expected, but there are millions of ways that supernova could be dimmer than expected. It was really um, the uh, Dublin map results and also the results of the CMB before Dublin map, uh, which really convinced people that uh, there is a dark energy. Okay? So uh, when we are doing this exercise of power spectrum matching, you know, there was some doubt that uh, we might not see it. So the fact that we saw it was pretty remarkable. Yeah. Incredible, we say. So let's go back to this math beautiful solution that we got. This is the exact solution of the delta rho over 4 rho minus psi during radiation era and assuming that the neutrino, neutrino and isotopic stress is zero. Pretty good solution. But of course, last of scattering surface is not radiation dominated. We need to match the solution to the uh, solution at the last of scattering surface. But for last of scattering surface, we didn't really have um, analytic solution that's varied at all wavelengths. We only had high frequency solution. So let's match this solution to high frequency solution and also uh, extrapolate or interpolate to large angular scales to get a full solution that's valid at all wavelengths, okay, all frequencies. To that end, we can also improve, so this is the solution where we ignore the time variation of R, that's the uh, baryon to photon density ratio. Uh, we ignore the time variation of that compared to the frequency of the oscillation Q. But we can improve on this by using WKB approximation. That's a bit better than just ignoring everything. That was worked out by uh, Peebles and you in 1970. So you got this one plus R to the minus quarter power in front of the oscillation. That's an improved solution. Now we match them. Notice that uh, here, coefficient of zeta is minus one. Uh, sorry, coefficient of cosine is minus one, okay? And because the uh, in sign, coefficient of sign is small in a high frequency limit, so again, you can use trigonometric uh, formula to absorb sign into the phase shift in the cosine term. Yeah? That would be the high frequency solution, but the low frequency solution, you have to get this thing incorporated as well. Then, that's the solution, okay? That's equation 6.5.7 Weinberg's book. Look at the co cosine, okay? So this, all, this is ought to go to uh, minus zeta, okay? Coefficient is ought to go to minus zeta from the uh, radiation dominated solution, or in other words, it's the perturbation that enter the horizon during radiation era. This is zeta over five, so S should be five in the high frequency limit. But in the low frequency limit, this should go to the Zach's Wolf limit. That's one third of phi, okay? Zeta is related to phi as, um, so zeta is minus three fifths, of, sorry, the zeta is minus five third of phi, which I will show you later. Therefore, this S should actually approach to one in the low frequency limit, okay? Here, there's a three R factor here, and uh, this comes from that term here, okay? So once again, phi is uh, uh, <laughs> five, uh, three fifths, three fifths of zeta, so that's why you have three fifths of zeta here, R here, and T, what is this T? This is the same T that the professor just showed you, transfer function. It goes to one in the low frequency limit and goes as one over Q square because potential decay during radiation era. We derived that result analytically yesterday as well. Potential decays because of the Poisson equation. You have log Q here because the dark matter potential actually grows uh, logarithmically in a, a small scale. So we know all of this, and then there's a phase shift that's, that's zero 
in a low frequency element, but if you go to high frequency element, due to the neutrino free streaming effect, phase shift is, is, a, uh, is a non zero in a high frequency element. That's the solution. Take the, once again, by the, you should be impressed by this. <laughs> That's it. That's everything. This is everything, okay? <laughs> One formula. And uh, the angular scale that divides the two is 140. Okay, that's the wave number that enters the horizon at the matter radiation equality. All right, let's take a limit. Ah, okay, now, it looks then that uh, the amplitude of fluctuations, oscillations, amplitude of oscillations, somehow increases by big factor from low frequency limit to high frequency limit. That's because gravitational potential decays during radiation error. So when perturbations enter the horizon, gravitational potential decays, and this gravitational effects boost the temperature fluctuations by factor of five. So that's, that's gonna be very important later. Another thing is that that factor of five here, and another thing here, is that the transfer function goes down as you go to the uh, uh, smaller scales. That's exactly what uh, Professor Sheth said uh, in the morning. Very good. And that's the neutrino anisotropic stress effect. We learned that yesterday also. So we understand everything. Take the limit, your Q goes to zero, and then this, uh, this combination goes to minus zeta over five. This should agree with one third of five, sorry, this, this thing goes to, minus zeta over five, this conserved quantity on the large angular scales. This should agree with phi over three, which means phi is, is ought to be minus three zeta divided by five. This is a useful formula to remember when you hear the uh, Professor Clevan's lecture on inflation next week. So you might as well take a note of that. In the high frequency limit, you get this, and look, compared to what you had in a Low frequency limit, uh, there's a factor of five times one plus r to the minus quarter. So there's a huge boost in power as you go to smaller scales. And once again, that's due to decay of gravitational potential during radiation era inside the horizon. Baryons, baryons is r, okay? R is the uh, baryon to photon energy density ratio. What does it do? It first reduces the amplitude of oscillations a little bit. Value of R is 0.6 at the last source cutting surface, okay? So it's not entirely negligible. And also adds to the uh, cosine, so there's a zero point shift in the oscillation, okay? Let's take a look. No baryon now, but of course, when we say no variance, uh, R is much, much less than unity, but if, of course, if there weren't any variance, there would be no photon baryon fluid, okay? So here, R is small, but not zero, okay? If we were zero, one second, it's important. Okay, if we were zero exactly, we wouldn't be talking about these sound waves. There would be no sound wave if there's no baryon, okay? Remember that. Because of this, uh, if there was no damping, uh, uh, sorry, what did I say? Yeah, yeah. If, there's no, if, if there was no silk damping, okay, amplitude of fluctuations, now I'm taking a square of that, amplitude of fluctuations, this is, this is a cosine square, okay? So amplitude of fluctuations would go up, 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 up. Uh, because of this extra factor of five boost due to the decay of uh, gravitational potential. But you see, you don't go, Immediately to five, it's a gradual process. And this effect is important only during radiation error, which means you can use this to determine when the radiation matter equality occurred. This will give you matter density, okay? I'll come up to that later. Now you then include silk damping, so it damps now okay, exponentially. So now, first peak, is high, but second peak is the highest, the third peak and the fourth peak and so forth. That's not quite what we expected, right? So, okay, let's move on. 
So this is a boost due to the decay potential. Silk dumping, okay? Then let's include variance. What it does is shift the zero point of oscillation, but because you're taking square, right? First peak goes up. You have to imagine that you have a cosine, you shift the zero point and it's square. The odd peaks go higher. Even peaks go lower. Now we have first peak that's the highest. Second peak, that's lower. Why didn't the third peak go higher compared to the no variant case? That's because of this one plus r to the minus quarter power. So that's a zero point shift. But then this one plus r to the minus quarter power made these third and fifth peaks unchanged. Okay? That's the barrier, okay? Do you understand this? All right, I'll come back to this later. Total matter. So we will be relying on this S that goes to five, okay? So in the absence of damping, power will go up, 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 okay? Now, if we lower the total matter density, Matter radiation equality happens later, okay? So, more and more low frequency modes are now boosted by decay of potential. So this enhancement occurs earlier. Therefore, if you compare that line which has less matter than the solid line, you see taller peaks. Yeah? So, um, decay of gravitational potential will boost the power by factor of five times this factor, and then this effect depends on total matter, total matter density, then variance will shift the zero point to make even peaks taller than, e uh, sorry, the odd peaks taller, even peaks lower, except third and fifth peaks because of this one plus r to minus quarter power. But not quite there yet, okay? Uh, many lectures stop here, but uh, we're not quite there. First peak is too low. And power spectrum don't go to zero. So what's, what, what's going on here, okay? So the answer is we haven't included Doppler shift. At the lateral scattering surface, plasma is moving with respect to the rest of frame of the cosmic micro background. They also produce extra anisotropies by uh, Doppler shift. Doppler shift is simply given by the velocity, yeah? The velocity using the energy conservation equation is given by time derivative of density. Now density is cosine. Velocity is sign, and when you add them up, it fills the zero, okay? Because sine square will be maximum when cosine square is zero. So they nicely uh, fill, the, fill the, uh, the gap. And uh, yeah, cosine becomes sine, and uh, so that will be the Doppler anisotropy. Your same S, but uh, you know, otherwise it's the same thing. You have just uh, sine here instead of cosine. You multiply the damping factor there, and then you get, so here, the dotted line is the uh, density cosine square without Doppler. First thing to note, even this doesn't go to zero, okay? The reason is that this mapping between L and Q, L is equal to QRL is only approximate, as I kept repeating. You receive various Q for one L. So you get power from other Qs so that this peak, is the, the, uh, the zeros are already filled by the fact that the mapping between Q and L is not exactly one-to-one. -one. But still, it's pretty, you know, pretty uh, 
deep dip, to which you add Doppler. Now they fill the, the troughs even more. Okay? Yeah? Good? So that's very nice, okay? So that explains many of the uh, features. Now, um, how about the first peak? Okay, so first peak, even if you add Doppler, is still far away from the exact answer. Okay? That's ISW. So when gravitational potential wells are constant, photons go inside the gravitational potential well, gain energy, get out, lose energy, they compensate each other, you don't get any change in temperature. But if gravitational potential wells are changing over time, you get a gain in energy. Remember that during radiation era, potential decays. Therefore, you get extra contribution from temperature and isotropies, but any ISW that occurred before decoupling will be erased because you don't see those thick photons, right? So you are sensitive only to ISW effect after the decoupling. But because it's after the decoupling, you sub they subtend bigger angles in sky. As a result, only the first peak gets boosted because anything higher than that will correspond to the angular scales before the last, the horizon, the angular scale of the horizon before the last scattering surface, okay? So here, the, uh, the, the, mo the wave numbers that correspond to horizon size at decoupling will be somewhere here. Anything beyond that would be the uh, perturbation that enter the horizon before the decoupling. So they have no, no ISW. ISW will be wiped away by scatterings. But first peak is boosted quite significantly, and not only that. ISW keeps giving you the extra temperature and isotropy after decoupling as photons propagate through the gravitational potential until the universe becomes fully matter dominated. Which means you get contribution not only at the first peak, but anything to the left of the first acoustic peak, okay? So peak location will be shifted to the left as well a little bit, but it gets fatter as well. Do you see? It gets get fatter here. So there's significant change in the shape of the first peak as well. This you can use to also infer total matter density. So total matter density can be inferred by ISW and decay of gravitational potential, this, this factor of S, the factor of five boost. And notice that the, both of these are general relativistic effects. But baryonic effects are hydrodynamical effects. Okay? So we, when we determine baryons, density from CMB uh, anisotropy, we use hydrodynamics. When we infer matter density from CMB and isotropy, we use GR. Right? That's how it works. Now, I'm going to walk you through everything once again, this time in a power spectrum space. So this is the highlight, okay? <laughs> highlight of this lecture. And let's see if I'm saying something, but let's see you can reconstruct what you see here before I say anything, okay? Dashed line has a smaller, has a larger baryon density, and dotted line has a smaller baryon density. First peak goes up, second peak goes down, third peak is almost intact, and so forth. Notice that the peak positions also changed. Is, is, why is that? Remember that peak positions are given by ratio of the sound horizon and the distance to the lattice scattering surface. If you change baryon density, it changes sound speed. Therefore, it changes the peak position as well. But that's, not, that's a trivial effect, okay? We don't, we're not really interested in that. We want to see how baryons changes the intrinsic power spectrum of the CMB fluctuations at the last certain surface. So let's adjust x-axis so that we get rid of the change in the peak locations. Now it's apparent that, um, for example, you compare a baryon density 
0.03 and 0.022. First peak goes up, second peak goes down, third peak is almost intact, forget this dot, which I'll come back to later. And the fifth peak is also not changing very much. Yeah, first peak goes up, second goes uh, uh, right? down. You understand everything. Yeah? Very nice. How about that? Here's the silk dumping. When you have smaller baryon density, tight coupling breaks down earlier because you don't have baryons to make photons fluid. You need baryons to make photons fluid, right? So you get extra dumping due to enhanced silk dumping. May you understand everything about baryonic effects on the power spectrum. Any questions? Sorry, I couldn't hear. What scale? Sorry, I'm sorry. The scale on the, the slide? Scale on the slide, yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. This is, this is um, neither log nor linear. It's plotted L to 0.6 power. This is uh, what we thought is nice to show in the Dublin papers. Yeah, I got the same question. Sorry that I couldn't catch it earlier. Um, when we gave Dublin talks, people asked that question. <laughs> it's indeed. It's a, it's a nice scale. It shows all the, it's much better than Planck plot. <laughs> oh, I forgot I'm recorded. Uh, sorry. <laughs> all right, now matter density, okay? Uh, dashed line has smaller matter density, dot line has a larger matter density. Smaller the matter density, higher the first peak. We understand that, okay? Let's try to understand the rest. Once again, by changing omega matter h square, you change the uh, you change the sun horizon. Also, distance to the last scattering surface is also modified. So let's adjust the horizontal axis. Now the genuine effect of the matter density at the last scattering surface. First of all, the enhancement is due to both the uh, ISW and uh, temperature boost due to radiation, uh, due to the decay of the gradation potential during radiation error. As you go to the second and third peaks, ISW has, doesn't do anything. But also the boost effect gets smaller and smaller because this boost approaches constant in the end. So the, the significant effect occurs at lower frequencies when the S factor is rising, right? Once it's a constant, it, do, it doesn't really matter how you change it because the, uh, the peaks are, you know, peaks are affected. Peak, because it's five, it doesn't matter whether you change omega matter or not. What changes is this rise of the curve, go one to five, right? This, this rise location depends on omega matter but not the limiting values. That's why as you go to higher peaks, there's no effect. So the, the, the first peak is mostly affected, and second and third peak are affected too, but the effects decrease gradually. That's everything that omega matter h squared does. Questions? Are you happy? This is it, okay? And uh, so now you can go to any CME talks and the speaker says something wrong, you can, make a, you can correct them. <laughs> Very nice. Let's look at the neutrinos. This is fun. Let's artificially increase the number of neutrino species from three to seven so that we can see the effect clearly. Neutrino has Five effects. I think it's five. One, two, three, <laughs> four. Four. Four effects. <laughs> huh? Is that right? Uh, uh, okay, let's 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 do this. If you add more neutrinos, you get more radiation density. Okay? Therefore, matter radiation equality will be delayed. There will be more decay in gravitational potential, so ISW, more ISW, and more boost due to the potential decay at first couple of peaks. 
Um, yep. So this is the effect. Okay, and effect is seven uh, and three solid line. Indeed, indeed, first peak is higher, but third peak is lower. So clearly, something is missing. Okay, but let's correct the first effect, this radiation effect. Let's increase dark matter density so that we have the same matter radiation equality redshift. We don't want to change baryon density because that will screw up other things. Let's only change dark matter density. Then you get this, okay? So that the uh, Z equality is now the same. Now you see near uniform suppression of the power above L of 100. This is suppression of amplitude due to anisotropic stress. This is a neutrino viscosity. Okay? And we detected this signal for the first time in 2009 using WMF data. Yeah, very good. Yes, indeed. So the, the question was, optical depth effect will be covered later, uh, very, very soon. This looks like uniform suppression, and that's very similar to what the optical depth does. Optical depth will suppress amplitude above L of 10. This effect is relevant only when most enter the horizon during the radiation error. That will be L of 140. So they're not exactly degenerate, but they're pretty close. Yes, indeed. Now we corrected the uh, stress effect, amplitude effect, by multiplying the whole thing above L of 140 by constant factor to compensate everything. Now you see more damping due to neutrino anisotropic stress, uh, sorry, neutrino effects. Hmm, what is that? That's weird. Neutrino shouldn't interact with photons or variants, at least not so strongly. So what's going on here? This is a bit tricky, okay? If you add the neutrino species, extra ones, they change the expansion rates. How the Friedman equation tells you that the expansion rate goes up if energy density goes up. Because sound speed, sound, sound horizon is sound speed times Hubble length. If you increase the Hubble, sound horizon decreases, okay? That's number one. So that will shift everything uh, horizontally, okay? Peak positions. But there's a diffusion length. Diffusion length is the geometric mean of the uh, photo mean free path and Hubble length. That also is reduced if you increase Hubble. But only square root. Sound horizon is linearly proportional to Hubble length. Diffusion length is only square root. So if you fix the first peak position, diffusion length would be um, smaller. So the net result is that this effect is due to the fact that once you normalize everything to the first peak, damping effect appears at the lower L because scaling due to H is different. You can correct for it by artificially reducing the number of electrons. Okay, so uh, more, sorry, artificially increasing the uh, electron number density. Here, you get damping, more damping, but uh, uh, if you have, if you have more electrons, baryons and photons are more tightly coupled, so less silk damping, so you can remove this thing, and you can do that by artificially increasing helium, because helium eats electrons. So you increase helium, sorry, <laughs> If you decrease helium, if you decrease helium, because helium eats electrons, there will be more electrons left at the last scattering surface. That will give you uh, less damping. So you do that. 
you hit him adjust it, and then you get nice results. But you know, they don't quite match up, you know? You see that? They don't quite. Zoom in here. There's a phase shift. After correcting all of this, there remains a phase shift. That's it. That's a phase shift. Okay? Cosine and sine are mixed due to the uh, neutrino stress affecting the Einstein's equation, thereby changing the gravitational potentials. That creates phase shift. That's that. So let's correct for it. Ta da! Now everything matches and you understand everything. Okay? That's what all neutrinos do. Or any neutrino like relativistic freely streaming collisionless particles. Any, any particles would do this. You can also have relativistic particles, but not an isotopic stress. Namely, you can have relativistic particles um, which collide. Okay? Then you don't get this, for example, phase shift. This is genuine to collisionless particles that propagate at the, the speed faster than the sound. Let's talk about two other effects, spatial curvature. For, throughout the lectures, we'll be assuming the universe is flat, Euclidean. What if it is curved? And another thing is optical depth. We have been assuming throughout that uh, after the universe became transparent at the redshift of uh, 1,000, the universe remained transparent. But what if it is not, okay? So spatial curvature, uh, the geometry tells you that peak positions will be determined by the, the uh, size of the sound horizon at the lasso scattering surface and distance to lasso scattering surface. And so far, I've been just saying distance without telling you what distance we're talking about. And the professor says, the first lecture nicely tells you the difference between their distances, difference between their distances, angular diameter distances, luminosity distances. Here, we should be talking about angular diameter distances because that's what the, that will give you the angle that subtains the sound horizon at the last of scattering. That dA, angular diameter distance, is different from this coordinate distance that I've been using. These two are equal in the flat universe, but they are different in the curved universe. For a positively curved universe, you can Taylor expand this complicated formula, and you discover that angular diameter distance is smaller in the closed universe. Things look bigger in the closed universe. And in, all, in the negatively curved universe, angular diameter distance is actually bigger, so things, gets, things look smaller, okay? For example, now this happens because lots of scattering surface is so far away, so we are sensitive to small curvature, so that would be the flat universe case, but then when universe is Positively curved, they look, the spots look bigger. And then if it's negatively curved, the spots look smaller. In terms of L, you just shift the peaks. And here, I'm fixing omega matter. So greater omega lambda means positively curved universe. Total omega, total omega will be greater than one. Because things look bigger, entire thing will be shifted to the left. Okay? If omega lambda is smaller than 0.7, so 0.7 is a flat universe case, if omega, matter, omega lambda is 0.5, omega matter is fixed, total omega is less than one, which means negatively curved universe, everything looks smaller, and you need to shift to the right. Now if you correct the x-axis by, uh, if you adjust the x-axis by the corresponding change in the angular diameter distance, everything lies on top of each other. So that, that's all curvature does. Except here, you see a funny thing going on when omega lambda is so crazily large. This is due to the decay of potential in a later time. In a later time universe, if lambda is too large, expansion is too fast for matter to cluster. Matter clustering is just loses its battle against expansion. Potential decays again, giving you extra 
perturbations. But because things happen at so, such a present time, they appear only on a very, very large angular scales, and less than 10. Difficult to detect, but it has been detected by cross-correlating these galaxies. How about optical depths? So uh, uh, photons propagate from the last skeleton surface to us. And it's not a secret that uh, um, current universe is actually fully ionized. Well, that's weird. The universe became, the universe became neutral and transparent at redshift 2000. But uh, we can also tell from the absorption lines of quasars that universe is actually fully ionized up to redshift of six. So something must have happened at the redshift of six, which is the uh, formation of stars. Stars ionize the universe, freeing electrons. So now free, electrons are now, ah, I'm free again. Uh, but because the universe has gotten so big that the density of electrons is actually pretty small, so they don't really scatter photons crazily, as crazily as before. Right? They were really enjoying scattering off the uh, photons before, but now they can't do this anymore. Uh, optical depths, you know, the optical depths would be much smaller than unity because density is so low. What it does is to simply expo exponentially damp the uh, temperature and isotropies that are reaching us. So t delta T over T will be multiplied by e to the minus tau times intrinsic. If, because E sub L is the power, you have e to the minus two tau. That's the effect, and uh, you see it's, uh, it's suppressed like that. So let me then correct by e to the minus two tau effect. It's L independent beyond L of 10. Less than L of 10 is not affected because that's actually greater than angular scales that are greater than the horizon at the time universe was ionized. But L, L greater than 10, everything is multiplied by the constant factor, so if you correct for it, yeah, no other effect. So that's all there is. We understand everything now, absolutely everything, okay? So important consequence of that is that because of this, if you use only temperature data, and error about here are so large because of the cosmic variance, this is where the information comes from. Therefore, you cannot actually determine the amplitude of potential fluctuations at the last scattering surface. Only thing you can observe is e to the minus two tau times amplitude of potential. This is not the good news because this is a precious information, right? Primordial amplitude of uh, fluctuations. Why is, it, is it, why is that a bad thing? For example, if you wanted to uh, predict how many galaxies we have today, or how many galaxy clusters we have today, you need to take this as, as an initial condition and calculate what would be the amplitude of fluctuation today. But if this is not known, you cannot make that prediction. In other words, whatever prediction we make for low redshift universe will be degenerate with tau. Most severe example is a neutrino mass. Neutrinos free stream steal the, steal the gravitational potential well. They slow down the structure formation. And the result is the uh, amplitude of galaxy power spectrum or amplitude or number of clusters will be fewer, will be suppressed relative to the case where neutrinos are absolutely massless. You're looking at a small difference in the matter fluctuation amplitude today due to neutrino mass. But small relative to what? It's small relative to the prediction given the primordial amplitude. But if primordial amplitude was not known due to tau, there is a severe degeneracy between neutrino mass and tau. Okay? So this is an important thing. But fortunately, there is a way. Scattering creates polarization. So if you can measure polarization of the cosmic micro background, you can determine tau uh, independent of this, of this effect, okay? So that will be the next topic, but before we get there, let's, let's appreciate how far we have come. So uh, uh, WMAP determined uh, these parameters quite precisely, so now you have 
omega bar in h square, omega dark matter h square, omega lambda, and amplitude of fluctuations and tau. These are the basic cosmological parameters that determine power spectrum of temperature fluctuations. And now you should be able to tell in words, not equations, in words what they do and why you could determine these parameters. Try that, okay? It's a good exercise. Words, no single equation, okay? Planck, consistent with W map, the body shifted around, but they're consistent. The error was a smaller, that's a good thing. If you add CMB lensing, this is the low redshift information. So adding this helps constrain low redshift quantities. For example, we have the amplitude of fluctuation here, but there is a prediction for the present day amplitude, which is sigma eight. This is a predicted value assuming lambda CDM, but this is not what we observe using CMB. What we observe in CME is AS, not sigma. That's a present day value. If you look at improvement from Planck to CME lensing, error of shrinks quite dramatically, okay? This is where CME lensing can really help. Value has gotten also a little bit less. This is, brings everything more consistent with the low redshift universe things. As I said, AS times e to the minus two tau is what's mostly, most precisely determined. So if you compare this result with AS, error bars have gone up quite dramatically, right? A factor of two, enhancement and error bar. That's because we don't know tau very, very well yet. Good. Any questions before we dive into polarization? Okay. Ah, yes? Um, because we set it to be zero. So this is the lambda CDM with, so the question was why do we not have tensor to scale ratio R here? Because we set it to be zero. So this is lambda CDM with inflation, if you like, that's very low scale. Or what well, we just say, uh, we, didn't, we didn't include gravitational waves. Thanks for the question. I'll, I'll come back to that tomorrow, okay? Good. Oh, yes? Ah, so uh, uh, when you have, um, so let's see. Um, we determine omega barium H square. We determine omega dark matter H square, but not omega matter or well, omega baryon alone without h square, okay? Um, now, there's omega lambda here, okay? That's coming from peak position, because this affects distance. Omega baryon, and I'm assuming flat universe, okay? So omega baryon plus omega dark matter plus omega lambda adds up to one, right? But we, so, omega baryon plus omega dark matter plus omega lambda adds up to one. That equation will give you H. Right? Because we know individual, yeah? That's how it works, yes. So what is tau value? Yeah, it's a tau integrated uh, over time, from present epoch to the distance past, e removing tau, that's coming from the standard recombination history. Indeed, uh, standard recombination history tells you that a neutral fraction is not zero even today from the Big Bang. Uh, it, it, uh, so the approach is to, to zero, but uh, then freezes out about 10 to the minus four level. If you integrate this over a long, long time, that they do give you non-zero value of tau. But this is the tau on top of that. So this is the tau coming from extra ionization due to, for example, reionization of the universe due to fossil stars in the lower rest universe. Yeah. Okay, so how about reionization history? Can we say anything about that from tau? The answer is no. 
Uh, but uh, in the future, when temperature polarization, polarization data improve, so that you can see the shape of the E mode power spectrum coming from ionization, then we can say not only the overall amplitude, but uh, for example, derivative in the ionization history, or maybe third derivative, but not much more. So we can have some rough idea about the ionization history with the precise uh, CME polarization data, but not, not much more. For that, we need something like 21 centimeter observations. All right. <clears throat> so next is polarization. CMB is weakly polarized. Why is that? So polarization is uh, you have the electric fields in x direction, electric fields in y direction. If the uh, light is unpolarized, like sunlight, no matter what oscillation directions you see, they have equal intensity. So photons propagating to the right here, you see two orthogonal polarization directions. When they have equal amplitude, there's no polarization. When one uh, direction has weaker amplitude than the other, it's polarized in x direction. Yeah, so um, this is very easy. It's very, this is very intuitive, actually. Uh, when is polarization generated? You need anisotropic incident light and scattering or reflection, okay? So sunlight comes from the above, so that's clearly anisotropic radiation field, okay? Radiation comes from the above, nothing else. And it's reflected about by the uh, windshield of the car. And this light is polarized horizontally. Okay? Why do I know that? Well, so we asked Talex, the company that makes polarized sunglasses, among other things. So they have these polarized sunglasses that block horizontally polarized intensity, but transmit vertically polarized intensity. Ta-da, you can see this in the car. Very nice. And of course, we are uh, interested, eh? if you go to the ocean, ocean also reflects uh, sunlight that's coming from the above. The reflected light is horizontally polarized. So if you go to Tarex and buy one of those polarized sunglasses and go to the uh, beach again and look at uh, the ocean, then you don't see reflected light. We use the same thing to measure polarization on the CMB. But wait a minute, you know, the universe doesn't have preferred direction, okay? So what, what is this anisotropic incident light? Yeah, where, where, where does that come from? The universe doesn't have any preferred direction. The universe doesn't have a preferred direction, but it has anisotropy, okay? Namely, when you have the incident light that's coming from left, and this light scatters electron and transmits the light, and just this is the case where you have a sunlight being reflected on the ocean or windshield of the car. Only because light is transverse, you cannot have the polarization that's longitudinal, parallel to the direction of the propagation. As a result, even if you had unpolarized light with equal amplitude and intensity in both polarization directions, only one gets uh, scattered, okay? Of course, the universe has no preferred direction, therefore, photons are coming from everywhere. If you combine the light, then, yeah, there's no polarization. But if electron is surrounded by anisotropic radiation, Quadrupole, you know? If electron sees hot, cold, hot, cold. I'm an electron, I'm surrounded by quadrupole. I scatter light and my light is coming toward you. That light is polarized, okay? So that's what you need. You need quadrupole temperature and isotropy seen from the electron. So imagine that this is a full sky view seen from an electron. This is L equals two, M equals zero, L equals two, L equals one, L equals three, L equals three. If you have any of those around an electron, 
then once that light is scattered and coming toward you, the light is polarized. How do you create polarization, quadrupole polarization? It's not easy. When photons and baryons are tightly coupled, they move together. So from the rest of frame of electrons, radiation is isotropic. So in the limit that everything is tightly coupled, no polarization. You need to have a breakdown of tight coupling. That's silk damping, remember? That's the viscosity. You need viscosity to create temperature quadruple around an electron. Okay, so sound waves can create polarization precisely because of the viscosity. Um, so, we study detail of that tomorrow. Let me define Stokes parameters, okay? That's a convenient quantity to define polarization. X-axis, Y-axis, you just lay down the X and axis however you want. Then I, I define that Q is amplitude of electric field in X direction minus amplitude in Y direction. And in that definition, in this kind of polarization, that Q is, is less than zero, Q negative, yeah? U will be the same thing, but uh, with respect to the 45 degree uh, rotated coordinates, that's U. Q less than zero, U is zero. Here, Q is zero, but U is less than zero, blah, 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 okay? That's my own definition of Stokes parameters. Of course, you rotate the coordinate by 45 degrees, Q goes to U, U goes to Q. Vice versa, okay? That's annoying. Uh, and uh, for, for, for example, if, because they transform like that, yeah, uh, you can make a compact notation by forming this complex quantity Q plus IU. Of course, Q and U are real quantities. These are observables. But I just artificially make this imaginary vector, Q plus IU. Then under the coordinate rotation, it picks up the exponential factor. The fact that there's a factor of two here means that the Q and U behave as if it were spin two field, like gravitational waves. Okay? We learned that during the gravitational wave lectures. Our alternative expression would be the polarization intensity that we Q squared plus U squared square root, that the intensity of polarization, independent of the angles, polarization directions, and you can define angle through U divided by Q, then you can write this way, Q plus IU is the amplitude times e to the 2i alpha, that's the polarization angle. Then under the coordinate transformation, naturally, alpha transforms by just theta, a phi, then Q is invariant under rotation because it's the total intensity. Then we have a problem, okay? So I defined Q and U with respect to my X coordinate and my Y coordinates. I made a measurement, and I say, I measured Q, but didn't find U. I presented my result in a conference, and somebody in the audience stood up. No, you are wrong. I made the same measurement 10 years ago. It was U. There's no Q. Mm. <laughs> because they depend on coordinates. <laughs> What's your x-axis? So uh, it would be nice to have coordinate independent things so that we don't fight unnecessarily. Uh, so that will be what's called E and B decomposition, and we'll do that tomorrow. In the meantime, let's look at this. This is the temperature power spectrum. This is the E mode power spectrum we will do tomorrow. This is a beam of the power spectrum coming from gravitational waves with tensor to scalar rate of 0 0.05. This is a beam mode from lensing that we don't cover because we don't talk about lensing today, or well, this lecture. Just appreciate, you know, you understand this completely. Absolutely 100% you understand this. Every single detail of it, okay? <laughs> Every single one of it. In fact, I didn't say it, I didn't say it but you, now you should be able to actually say why second and third peak are equal amplitude. Okay, if you, if you look back to your slides, you actually 
have the answer. Uh, I, I don't tell you. Uh, just a bit of a spoiler. Look, there's no polarization in large angular scales because it's tightly coupled, no viscosity. Viscosity kicks in as a silk damping, so when temperature power spectrum begins to damp, E mode power spectrum rises, and this clearly shows you that uh, this is caused by the viscosity. If you look at carefully, troughs and peaks are out of phase relative to temperature. Why is that? I didn't tell you yet. That will be covered by tomorrow's lecture. I stop here. Thank you very much.